Hello there folks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, today I'm going to be discussing art in relation to human evolution. Uh, I'll be doing so by way of evolutionary psychology, which is a branch of the field of psychology more broadly, which seeks to identify which human psychological traits are evolved adaptations, that is, products of natural selection or sexual selection. Much like the way we evolved hands, eyes and the immune system over millions of years, so too, according to this theory, did the mind evolve into the form that it takes today. Human nature then, according to evolutionary psychology, is viewed as the product of a set of evolved psychological adaptations to recurring problems which our distant ancestors faced. To put it another way, Evolutionary psychology asks how the history of the human species created a legacy of psychological features, functions and preferences which continue to affect us directly or indirectly long after the environment in which these features were adaptively formed disappeared. So in other words, we evolved to uh, survive as cave dwellers and even though we're not cave dwellers anymore, that's still the period where our minds as they are today uh, took shape. To give you an example, uh, my, one of my favourite speculations from this system of thought is that the reason we enjoy crisps or potato chips, if you're American, is because millions of years ago our distant ancestors used to eat crunchy bugs. Right? So we evolved a fondness for crunchy food uh, and with that fondness now we eat crisps. So that's just kind of a fun speculation, but it gives you a sense of how we evolved certain habits or traits. The evolution of anatomically modern humans is believed to have occurred during the Pleistocene, as it's called, that's a geological epoch, which lasted from about uh, 2,588,000 years ago to about 11,700 years ago. Uh, so that's also more or less the period uh, when the human mind uh, took shape as well in its sort of modern form. So, behaviours or traits that occur universally in all cultures are good candidates for evolutionary adaptations, uh, such as the ability to infer other people's emotions, discern family from non-family, or cooperate with others. There have been studies of human social behaviour related to things like marriage patterns, promiscuity, parental investment, and a host of other human behaviours. With topics like these, it's quite easy to see what the evolutionary advantages are. Some people then are promiscuous because unconsciously they want to have uh, as many babies as possible, or if you like, spread their genes as widely as possible. Uh, people get married because humans found during human evolution that we're more likely to thrive and successfully co-parent if we form these sort of uh, courtship bonds. I'll make a brief aside, I realise that there are a lot of people who choose not to have children or never decide to get married or enter a long-term partnership. This poses an important question to evolutionary psychology, but it's one that can be addressed another time. And I don't think uh, that there are exceptions to the rule means that the idea of evolutionary psychology is without merit. In a sense, art may seem like a mystery when looking at human behaviour from an evolutionary perspective since it is non-utilitarian. That's to say, something utilitarian possesses a practical application. If something is non-utilitarian, it doesn't bring you food, it doesn't keep you warm, bring wealth, or possess any functional use. Uh, so why do humans as a species produce art? That's the question that's going to frame today's clip. So, we're looking today then at evolutionary theories of art. Four principal evolutionary explanations for the emergence of art are going to be detailed in this clip. They'll be called the pleasure, sexual display, socialization and play accounts of art. My sense is that all of these theories tell a part of the story when it comes to uh, the human activity of artistic practice. I'll mention that um, uh, the book that's principally informed this video is, is this one here called uh, Evolution, Literature and Film. 
uh, as edited by Brian Boyd, Joseph Carroll and uh, Jonathan Gottschall. So I'll leave a link uh, to this in the uh, description below. Pleasure then. Uh, this theory was put forward by Steven Pinker. Um, Pinker suggests that aesthetic experience is essentially an entity developed to press our quote pleasure buttons, famously dubbing art cheesecake for the mind. I'm going to quote him at length. We enjoy strawberry cheesecake, but not because we evolved a taste for it. We evolved circuits that gave us trickles of enjoyment from the sweet taste of ripe fruit, the creamy mouthfeel of fats and oils from nuts and meat, and the coolness of fresh water. Cheesecake packs a central wallop unlike anything in the natural world because it is a brew of mega doses of agreeable stimuli which we concocted for the express purpose of pressing our pleasure buttons. Pornography is another pleasure technology. At least to some extent, art may be a third. So this I think is a useful concept and pleasure is certainly part of the story when thinking about art. Uh, if I listen to a good album, contemplate a good painting, or enjoy a new movie, I experience pleasure. But as Pinker somewhat implies uh, towards the end there, this shouldn't be taken as the entire story, because doing so would offer a somewhat reductive view of artistic appreciation. Many works of art aren't just about bringing pleasure, they want to provoke, inspire, challenge, or stimulate. Some artworks, like horror movies or thrillers, might even give you negative emotions, like making you feel tense or fearful. Avant-garde works of art can stress and stretch your aesthetic appreciation in new directions. So uh, art then isn't just about pleasure. If all you wanted to do was experience pleasure, you could sit around eating chocolate cake, or indeed cheesecake, and have someone tickle your toes, sit in the sun, watch pornography, as Pinker implies, or whatever it is that gives you pleasure. Evidently, art does something more than simply supply pleasure. You might say art offers something more lofty that nourishes the soul, as well as delight the senses. But I think it's certainly fair to say that pleasure is a part of the story. The second explanation then, sexual selection. Here, the psychologist Jeffrey Miller has proposed that artworks serve the purpose of sexual display, suggesting that body painting, jewellery and clothing were probably the first art forms Miller says the following, the production of useless ornamentation that looks mysteriously aesthetic is just what sexual selection is good at. Artistic ornamentation beyond the body is a natural extension of the penises, beards, breasts and buttocks that adorn the body itself. So art began with fashion, if you like, from early indigenous tribes all the way up to modern day fashion and everything in between. Beyond adorning the body with ornaments then, the earliest artists, Miller suggests, later found they could impress potential mates by sharpening a good stone or, and banging a good drum, and then further on down the line they found that good artists could create good stories, perform well on stage, paint a beautiful picture, and so on. So this theory of producing art to attract potential mates connects back to animals like the male bowerbird who collects objects and puts them on ornamental displays to impress female bowerbirds, or the pufferfish, the male pufferfish who creates sand patterns for the same purpose of uh, attracting attention of uh, female pufferfish so they can uh, procreate. This theory adds something to the discussion, I think, with a couple of provisions. First, it says more about why artists create work than it says about why we consume it. That is to say, it may be that on some unconscious level, artists want to attract potential mates. So it tells us about the artists, but what about those who appreciate the artworks? Uh, just because I like the album Dark Side of the Moon doesn't mean I'm in love with the guys from Pink Floyd, right? Second, there are plenty of people who aren't in the business of uh, making babies or procreating, spreading their genes, who still love to make art, such as children and the elderly, including postmenopausal women. Plus, of course, there's simply those artists who don't want children. So like I said previously, even though uh, there are some instances which uh, can be understood as exceptions to the general rule, it's still possible that people who make art are inheritors of that much earlier um, urge to, to produce art then, even if it's not in a modern context, to impress potential mates. 
That's to say then, uh, the idea that this is how art began seems like a fair speculation to me, even if it later evolved into other things. So that's the sexual selection theory. The third theory I'm going to put forward uh, is called the socialization account. This broadly focuses on the narrative arts, beginning with ancient oral traditions of storytelling up to contemporary literature, television and movies. Here I'm bringing together the research of theorists like Leda Cosmides and John Tooby, Ellen Desanayake, Dennis Dutton and Torben Grodal. All of these thinkers broadly address a similar principle, although you can learn uh, about the finer distinctions between them by reading them individually. According to the socialization account, as I understand it, we're attracted to stories, all of which feature themes that derived from evolved needs and interests which our ancestors faced, such as failing, succeeding, finding love, escaping harm, and so on. Tilburn Grodal, a film scholar, suggests that fictional narrative films are often made to elicit strong emotional responses, activating innate emotional dispositions, whether these responses are appropriate to a modern day environment or not. He says the following. Certain central innate dispositions cue our liking for stories about the attachment between children and parents or stories about romantic relations between adults. Fighting and aggression, as well as bonding with brothers in arms, are as prominent as ever in visual fictions. Even though most people nowadays live in societies in which the majority of adults never engage in violent confrontations, horror stories still often focus on the fear of becoming food for some other alien creatures. So we watch movies like Alien, for example, because we have a deep-seated fear inherited by our ancestors of being eaten by wild animals in the jungle. We watch rom-coms because we're interested in vicariously experiencing the process of romantic attachments being formed. We're drawn to action movies because our distant ancestors sometimes faced violent confrontations, even if most of us don't find ourselves in that situation today. Movies, TV shows and fictional literature all give us a range of life experiences from the safety of our living rooms uh, without the high risk and stress levels of having to engage in these things in real life. Even movies that are set in a fantasy context still engage familiar concerns like overcoming obstacles, confronting challenges, defeating our opponents and so on, all things that we evolved to uh, care about. So we get to experience these things at the movies, on television, or by uh, reading fictional literature. So that's the socialization account. Finally then we can look at uh, what I'm calling the play account. Um, and this comes from Brian Boyd in his book On the Origin of Stories. So according to Boyd then, uh, art derives from the human instinct for play. Boyd suggests that when lion cubs play fight, and children engage in chase games in the schoolyard, they are unconsciously rehearsing adult activity in situations of low urgency, uh, so that they might fare better in moments of high urgency in the wild, so that's to say uh, an actual fight or being chased by uh, a predator. After playing repeatedly, humans and animals refine their survival skills and sharpen their sensitivities, they get better at it. As such, play is rewarding then, motivating humans and animals to engage in it time and again, enhancing muscle tones and improving their performance skills. Art, by extension, according to Boyd, is a complex cognitive version of play that does not involve exercising the body since humans gain more advantages from intelligence than from coordination or strength, as opposed to animals since we don't have to survive in the wild. Humans possess a kind of appetite for information, especially patterns that fall into meaningful arrays from which we can make rich inferences like fictional narrative, visual art and music. Boyd summarises his theory like this. We can define art as cognitive play with pattern, just as play refines behavioural options over time by being self-rewarding, so art increases cognitive skills, repertoires and sensitivities. A work of art acts like a playground for the mind, a swing or a slide or a merry-go-round of visual or oral or social pattern. Like play, art succeeds by engaging and rewarding attention, since the more frequent and intense our response, the more powerful the neural consequences. 
We like art and games then, both of which remember are non-utilitarian, i.e. Uh, they don't get us food or shelter or keep us warm, because they exercise the mind in ways that would have enhanced our fitness when we were cave dwellers during the Pleistocene. For example, games can rehearse strategic, inferential and reflex responses, as in the case of chess, crosswords and video games, for example. Usually, narrative fiction easily engages our skills of comprehension and also exercises our ability to engage with other agents and vicariously experience hypothetical situations relevant to human survival. Okay, so wrapping up then, all of these evolutionary theories of art pleasure, sexual selection, socialization and play tell part of the story, I think. I don't think they're all mutually exclusive and they can work together to help build a larger picture in developing an evolutionary account as to why art, in all its forms, became a human activity. Okay, so thanks a lot for watching. Um, feel free to uh, leave a like, a comment or a subscribe and I will see you for the next one. Bye for now.